Hi, I'm Philip Presley. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at North Carolina State University. Today, we're going to talk about thermal conversion and waste to energy process modeling within the Solid Waste Optimization Lifecycle Framework, or SWL. So we're going to start with an introduction to waste to energy, kind of discuss what it is. Then we're going to go to data development, how we made our model, the data for our model, look at some of the example equations um, that make our model run, and then explore some illustrative results. So what is waste to energy? Waste to energy is a conventional is a facility that combusts an input waste and generates electricity and or heat. So when a facility produces both electricity and heat, we often call that combined heat and power or CHP. So our waste to energy process model calculates electricity and heat generation as well as costs and output masses, specifically the ash stream and the metals the recovered metal stream we also calculate stack emissions associated with combusting one metric ton or megagram of waste with a particular composition so here's kind of an overview of our process model we see that there's user inputs as well as a mass input um, at the top and these two things combine to allow us to predict direct emissions the electricity and heat generation, as well as capital and operating costs. And then, as mentioned before, we also calculate recovered metals and ash. So here's a system diagram where we see that waste energy facilities are tied to pretty much every other facility or process in the solid waste system. We see that a lot of residuals or collected streams can be taken to the thermal facility for further treatment or the ash and recovered metal streams that are output can be treated downstream. So our model allows waste to energy performance to vary with waste composition. So in the bigger S-Wolf model, waste compositions are allowed to change in five year increments. So if you want to run a scenario where fiber is decreasing or food waste is increasing over time, our model accommodates that. And to get variations in emissions and electricity generation, we use the physical and chemical properties of each waste fraction. We use things like lower heating values and elemental compositions. So in our model, we use these waste material properties and some of the facility data to calculate both the electricity and heat generation. And one of our pri primary mechanisms for doing that is an energy balance. So here we're going to see the lower heating value, which encompasses the energy going into the system in the waste. It's equal to the uh, ele generated electricity plus the recovered heat plus the heat loss. And we know that heat loss can occur from the moisture coming in or with the ash going out as well as just general inefficiency in the system. So our model obviously has to have data um, and it does have a pretty good set of default data which was primarily gained from Covanta, a North American waste to energy company, as well as from the peer-reviewed literature and engineering judgment. We have done what we can to assemble the best set of default data available to allow us to optimize solid waste systems. And in our model, we're going to see that we have two big data types. The first are waste fraction types, which, as we mentioned, have elemental compositions as well as heating values. But they also have things like metal recovery efficiencies, which allow us to estimate the recovery efficiency for each waste component. So for an aluminum can, we might have a very high um, recovery rate while for things that m might have less aluminum, they would have a lower recovery rate. And as far as facility goes, um, we also see that there are things like costs and emissions data that are facility specific. So here's kind of some sample data. In the top table, we see that there are material properties for food waste, which is, seems to be going up as far as relatively in the composition and then fiber which is decreasing in the waste stream. 
we see that the moisture content varies significantly between these two types of materials and then we see that there's a volatile solids column and this is important because this shows how much of the mass we can actually combust. Um, the lower heating value allows us to do our energy calculations and then there's some carbon and hydrogen values which just demonstrate some of our elemental composition. Then the second table we see just some economic parameters the lifetime of the facility as well as capital and O&M costs. And then in the final table these are facility performance parameters. So we see an electricity production efficiency for both state-of-the-art and average facilities as well as aluminum recovery efficiencies which could be also by waste fraction as well as an emission example here carbon monoxide um, which just kind of allows us to calibrate our model to an individual facility. So as we mentioned before our model calculates mass throughout the system and within a waste of energy the waste energy process itself. So the model is capable of using beneficial reuse though to date that functionality has not been used and we also know that we recover both ferrous and non-ferrous metals. So our elemental composition includes aluminum, copper, and iron content for each waste fraction. And then we also have recovery efficiencies as user inputs. So one of the first calculations that we need to do is calculate how much air our system requires to combust the waste. This allows us to effectively and accurately estimate emissions. So in this equation, um, we're calculating the number of moles of air supplied noted by alpha on the left using an empirical equation that utilizes the carbon, chlorine, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur contents of the waste. So this input air composition um, is then going to be set is then going to be used to set the flue gas to 7% oxygen um, based on the fact that waste energy regulations um, are almost always in parts per million volume at 7% oxygen. Here's a carbon dioxide calculation and if we notice in the top left that we see a very complex looking compound and that's just here meant to represent the waste component or waste fraction then we see that the waste in plus the air plus water that's that's our input that top line and that's going to equal our carbon dioxide water sulfur dioxide diatomic nitrogen diatomic oxygen and hydrochloric acid so here we're just using stoichiometry um, to estimate carbon dioxide and obviously we have to solve this equation um, but this is our primary mechanism to calculate carbon dioxide there are also other non-metal stack emissions, things like sulfur dioxide, um, carbon monoxide and particulate matter, that we are very interested in calculating. Um, but a lot of them are tied to facilities and not necessarily tied as much to the actual waste components themselves. So what we've done here is we take facility input data, which is often in terms of parts per million volume, and then we do some unit conversions, tie it to the molecular mass of the compound, and then some air parameters to calculate the emission. Here we see that there's a meters cubed flue gas per mass waste, and that's, that's going to be calculated using the air supplied or alpha value that we saw earlier. So as far as metal emissions, we have many different elemental compositions that include many different elements um, of interest in the heavy metals. However, it's important to note that a lot of the metals associated with waste energy emissions result from e-waste, things like computers, televisions, and cell phones, and we haven't modeled those in detail. So if your focal point of your analysis is metal emissions, we encourage you to pursue other methods specific to your facility to estimate those emissions. So here's kind of some results we've done just looking at our model from a pretty high level. 
So here's some stack emissions. These are going to be life cycle inventory data. Just kind of the, the broad results of our model before we looked at anything. Um, we see some of the things we've discussed, the sulfur dioxide down on down to nitrous oxide and hydrocarbons. Um, we calculate all these things and these are based on a waste composition from Seattle, Washington and they represent a state-of-the-art facility. If either the waste composition or the state-of-the-art facility was moved to an average facility, we would expect these values to change. So speaking of waste compositions, we want to explore if we adjust the waste composition, how does that affect global warming potential? So we looked at four different waste compositions, including two different compositions from Seattle. And we wanted to see how does this, how do these changing compositions affect total results? And what we found was that the model estimates between 670 and 830 kilowatt hours per megagram um, for each, depending on the waste composition chosen. So this is almost a 25% change um, based on just what your default waste composition put in the model was. And as we can see in the far right, a lot of these waste compositions are getting larger. And that means that more electricity has been produced. Um, just because greater electricity equals greater offset, and the greater offset is going to have a greater offset GWP, or global warming potential. Also important to note is in the offset GWP, we see that metal recovery associated with recovering aluminum and ferrous and avoiding virgin production has been included there. So something else that we often encounter is we have to make choices regarding which offset data we use. And just in the U.S., we have different uh, regions of the electricity grid that range from 0.42 to 1.08 of kilograms CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. So that's a pretty wide range. And as we can see in the graph on the left, the choice of that, um, the choice of region often affects our total system result or in this case just our waste energy facility result. So when we look in the far left we see that's the highest the highest GWP that's the 1.08 kilograms per kilowatt hour and so the implication here is that if we choose dirtier energy or we're offsetting energy with greater emissions that will have greater offsets versus somewhere where the global warming potential per kilowatt hour is a lot less. So if the energy is cleaner to start with, we're not going to get as much of a savings associated um, with implementing new technology. So each one of, the, because these this range represents geographic area, it's important to think about which where your facility is located whenever you're making these choices um, of, as far as to use LCI data. And when you're documenting exactly when you're documenting your analysis you want to be clear of exactly what you did and make sure that you have fairly compared your systems and as we see on the left that figure shows a lot of variation and sometimes in our analyses it benefits us to use sensitivity analysis to show how important some of our assumptions really are if you'd like to see more about this model um, we can look at the Harrison paper um, some things, a few things have changed, but that gives a pretty good idea of where this model started. And we can also go to the S. Wolf website. We'd like to thank the National Science Foundation and the Environmental Research and Education Foundation for their support of the S. Wolf project.